All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what's new in Angular. I'm Minko Gechev, the product and DevRel lead on Angular. And I'm Jessica Janik, a senior software engineer on Angular. And I'm Jeremy Elborn, tech lead for Angular. So you two, I've been hearing a lot the community talking about this Angular renaissance. And now I know we have a lot of talented people on the team. Have we been getting more into arts and literature? You know, Minko, I think people have been saying that because we've we have been, been shipping. <laughs> What have you been shipping? Well, we shipped deferrable views. That's right. Last year, we published a request for comments on deferrable views, and developers are now enjoying it in their apps. <laughs> yeah, and that's not the only RFC or request for comment that we published last year. We also published an RFC for the new control flow syntax last year, and we shipped that in Angular version 17. We also recently shipped support for Material 3 in Angular Material. And there is a blog, of, blog post about it, so make sure you check blog.angular.io. And we also shipped new Signal APIs for components and directives. And we shipped so much more across the Angular CLI, Angular DevTools, components, documentation, lifecycle hooks, and this just goes on and on. And everything that we are shipping is in service of our mission, to help developers like you ship web apps with confidence. And we're doing that by making it easier to build faster apps. We're doing that by giving you tools to build apps faster. And we're doing that by keeping Angular as stable and reliable as possible. During this session, we're going to talk about all of the new Angular features that you can use to more effectively build and ship web apps. But first. We're going to share some very exciting news about the future of Angular. So as most of you know, the team has spent a lot of time working on signals. It was just less than one year ago that we published our request for comments for Angular Signal, and we got an incredible community response with over 1,000 comments. So clearly, there was a lot of interest. But it turned out there was more interest than just in the Angular community, and something we didn't predict happened. Google actually has another web framework called Wiz. And Wiz is not an open source framework. It's internal specifically to Google. And it's actually very tightly coupled to Google's internal tech stack, which is pretty different from what's popular out in the open source world. Wiz is hyper-focused on performance above all else. And this is why many of Google's biggest flagship consumer products are built with Wiz, like search, chat, meet, photos, play, and more. Yeah, and Angular and Wiz have both existed in some form or another for over 10 years. And in the beginning, the types of UI that developers would build with these two different frameworks were also rather different. Wiz applications tended to be more consumer-focused for products that were really latency-sensitive. And Angular applications were much more interactive, a lot of overlap with what people would commonly call enterprise UIs. But we saw that over time, the lines between these two types of UI started to blur. Wiz developers inside of Google started wanting more features like Angular. And Angular developers, both inside and outside of Google, wanted more performance-oriented features like Wiz. And it became clear that the two frameworks were converging on a lot of the same ideas. And people inside of Google started to ask, why are we duplicating so much work between these frameworks? And so last year, the stars aligned, and we struck upon some serendipity. Just as we were building out our signal primitives, Wiz was actually looking at doing the exact same thing. And even better, there was a product team that was super enthusiastic to collaborate on an initial version and get something running in production on a pretty aggressive timeline. So with, a, with an aggressive timeline like that, it must have been like a pretty small product, right? Yeah, it's super tiny. Maybe some of you have heard of it. So today, Angular Signals Primitive are in production for 100% of the YouTube's mobile web traffic. <laughs> YouTube has been collaborating with both Angular and Wiz for a better part of a year now on the development and adoption of Angular Signals. And YouTube is currently in one of their biggest migrations ever to Wiz which is going to introduce a reactive rendering for their whole application that is based entirely on Angular Signals. 
Now, we can dive a little bit deeper to look into how YouTube uses Angular signals. First, signals, they meet all the prerequisites of YouTube's platforms. They need to support many different browsers in devices, for instance, like all the way from shorts, running them on mobile, to running web apps on smart TVs with YouTube living room. The bundle size of signals is also pretty small. And this meets the requirements for YouTube's mobile web traffic, where most of the users are actually on a pretty slow network connection. And it tops every single synthetic benchmark that the YouTube team came up with. To the YouTube, so the YouTube, they, they kicked off some projects to answer big questions. For example, are the performance gains of signals, are they at, at least like scalable? Can we scale them with large, messy code bases? Can existing problems be modeled with signals in a reasonably natural way? And do signals lead to better code? The YouTube team, they rewrote a large part of the, their UI, and they focused on things that were pretty challenging and representative. And the results actually exceeded their expectations. Yeah, and it has gone really well. On lower end devices, the YouTube team has observed a 35% improvement to interaction latency on living room as you're navigating through video tiles. On the video player controls, the change brought about all, uh, brought all key interactions to a consistent 60 frames per second with relatively minimal effort, up from an occasionally jittery 25 frames per second based on YouTube's legacy virtual DOM-based rendering model. Shorts also reached 60 frames per second and lower interaction latency during swiping, which meaningfully increases top-line metrics like views and watch time. So reviewing the new signal-based code, the team concluded that they preferred the new reactive rendering model, and there were a few main reasons for that. Number one, it was easier to achieve high performance. Often, developers really didn't have to think about performance at all. Usually, the idiomatic way to do something was also the fastest way, even for complex UIs like the three we just mentioned. Number two is that signals simplify framework concepts related to the virtual DOM, like memoization, stale closures, unexpected re-renders, and rules of hooks. And number three, sometimes it was actually easier to model infrastructure. Although sometimes it was harder because the YouTube engineers had to think more about their data flow. But the resulting code was usually something that they considered more maintainable. In all, they credit much of that viability to some of the modern signals features that they just hadn't seen before, like auto tracking, automatic cleanups, and dynamic dependencies. YouTube is already running hundreds of these components in production, and the YouTube team is hoping to power all of YouTube web apps with signals over the next two years. This collaboration with YouTube has been a huge success for both Angular and the Wiz team, and this project established a great model for our ongoing collab collaboration between our teams. And going forward, Angular and Wiz are going to be working together much more closely and sharing even more code. Working together in this way is going to help us year after year continue making Angular better for everyone. All right, so it seems like signals, they work pretty well for Angular and Wiz. Is there anything we can do to introduce signals to the broader JavaScript ecosystem? Well. The Angular and Wiz teams have been involved with even broader conversations with the web ecosystem experts to advocate for signals as a JavaScript language standard feature in the JavaScript Standardization Committee, TC39. And as of a couple of weeks ago, they're now actually at stage one. The reference implementation of signals is based on Angular signals because they've actually already proved their efficiency at scale with YouTube. Now, after hearing all this news about signals, you probably can't wait to hear more about how you can use signals in your applications. Yeah. Well, we've got good news for you because there's a slew of new APIs that have landed in Angular that are ready for you to use in your code. We're going to talk about four types of new APIs today for building your Angular components and directives with signals. All of these APIs are available now in Developer Preview. The first API we're going to talk about are the new signal-based query APIs. And when I say queries, I'm talking about Angular APIs like 
view child and content children that if you've used Angular before, you've probably used these. And you may also have felt that these were a little bit verbose. Yeah, Jeremy, this type here, it barely even fits on the slide. Yeah, so maybe we can do better. And let's take a look at the new APIs based on signals. Definitely way cleaner, way shorter. Yeah, shorter, easier to read. These new APIs now give you a signal of your query results, regardless of whether you're querying for a single element or multiple elements. And you can use that signal result in computed expressions and effects. It's overall more concise, more consistent, and better takes advantage of type inference. And on top of that, there is a bonus feature as well. With these new APIs, you can now mark a query as required. If a required query doesn't have a result, Angular will report an error. And because it will report this error, the API then can remove undefined from the type of the result since Angular guarantees that it's there. That's definitely going to allow developers to write safer code. Absolutely. OK, now for the big one that everyone has been waiting for, signal inputs. Yeah, we've been having a very popular issue about reactive inputs. So if you've built anything with Angular before, you're familiar with input properties. Inputs are optional by default, but can also be marked as required. Here's the same with signal-based inputs. And just like queries, you can use the values of these inputs in computed expressions and effects, which dramatically simplifies patterns where you're inspecting these values for changes in NGON changes. Input signals are read-only, so it always remains clear where a particular piece of state is coming from. So since we're talking about inputs, are we doing anything about outputs? Why, there certainly is. But I do want to make a bit of a clarification about outputs, which is that outputs are not actually signal-based. I've seen this as a common misconception among Angular developers. At outputs actually work the same way that they always have in Angular. So if outputs are not signal-based, why do we even have to introduce a new API? Well, there's a few different reasons that we'll talk about during this talk. But there is really just one big one. It looks kind of weird, really, if you're using the signal-based input and signal-based queries and the decorator-based output. We want the experience of authoring signal-forward components and directives to feel more holistic. And so let's take a look at that holistic API. Well, this definitely got rid of a lot of boilerplate as well. Yeah, again, it's shorter, more readable, and you can't forget to create a new event emitter as part of this. So when you use this API, you can still call emit the same way that you always have, and event handling also still works the same way that it always has. OK, so that finally brings us to model inputs. To talk about model inputs, we need a brief aside on two-way binding. Sometimes you have a bit of state that you want to keep in sync between two components. And Angular has had a feature that lets you accomplish this called two-way binding. In this example, whenever the isAdmin value updates, the checked property of the checkbox also updates. And, when, and also the other way around. When, when someone interacts with the control and updates that checked state, those changes propagate back to isAdmin. And in the past, if you wanted to make a property two-way bindable, you had to introduce an input, but then also introduce an output that had the same name as the input, but with change on the end, and also make sure that the output emits the same type as the input. Yeah, Jessica, I'll be honest, this looks pretty clunky to me. It is pretty clunky. So fortunately, adopting signals gives us an opportunity <laughs> to make this a lot simpler. <laughs> So let's just jump back and forth a little bit so you can compare the two. Way cleaner, right? I love it. I'm way happier with it. Me too. So model gives you a writable signal, so you can update values directly, and then they propagate values back through those two-way bindings. So let's go back and look at how we're binding into this model input again, but this time with a signal. Notice that the two-way binding passes the signal instance rather than reading the value from the signal. And in this way, the two-way binding defines an explicit contract where the profile component is granting access to the checkbox component to write new values. And making this explicit fits into our goal of making your code safe and predictable. Yeah, we really think that these new APIs are going to improve your experience authoring Angular components and directives, again, they are all available right now in developer preview. 
the most recent of which, the Output API, was released in Angular 17.3. So these APIs, they seem great. If I start using them right now, is my application going to be completely zoneless? And can I finally get rid of this zone.js import from like, my code or from Angular.json from Polyfills? Well, we still have some improvements we want to make before we actually recommend that people go fully zoneless. Using the new Signal APIs is a huge leap forward. But there's still some work we need to do before the experience is as streamlined as we'd really like it to be, in particular uh, when it comes to how the framework schedules tasks and how you interact with change detection in tests. But we're making progress towards that point where we have a well-lit path forward in fully driving UI updates from Signals. We may have some announcements in a couple of days here. Well, whenever we talk about signals on social media, we often get one question more frequently than others, and which is, how does ArcGIS fit in here? Well, together with everything we talked about so far, we have one more independent long-term effort, and it is to make ArcGIS optional. Where optional means that we would like to enable you to build applications without strictly requiring and depending on ArcGIS in your bundle. This way, we can simplify Angular's learning journey so you don't have to start and you are in, have, get to learn RxJS from the beginning. And also, it is going to allow us to like, more holistically evaluate how we are using RxJS in Angular and be more intentional about it. And also, it is going to enable you to ship applications with minimal dependencies. But importantly, for developers that choose to use RxJS, we want that integration to be better than it ever has been. And our approach to doing this is by introducing a set of interop APIs for Angular and RxJS. You can find these, these interop APIs under Angular Core RxJS Interop. You have probably already seen the first few APIs in this interop package, which lets you create RxJS observables from signals and the other way around. This, for example, provides you a way to create an observable from a signal-based input that we talked about earlier. But I think what we did with the new output API is a perfect example of how we're applying this philosophy. So let's take a look at this decorator-based output here. Now, not everyone may realize this, but this event emitter class actually extends RxJS's subject class. And that ends up being kind of confusing sometimes. Subjects have things like a completion state and an error state, which doesn't really apply to the way that Angular deals with events. Even more surprising, we discovered that some people we're using a pattern like this, creating an output, not with an event emitter, but with some arbitrary observable. I'm really surprised outputs were designed to do that. They actually were not designed to do this, and this pattern has only ever worked by accident. <laughs> so when we are creating this new output API, we made the decision to make this API not strictly depend on RxJS. So when you call this output function, you are getting an object, yeah. an object called output emitter ref rather than an event emitter. And if you want to create an observable from this output, there's an API for that, output to observable. And for those scenarios when you want to emit outputs based on an existing observable, you can use the new function output from observable. The work we did here on outputs was originally motivated by our goals with signals and building signals into components and directives. But it also gave us an opportunity to remove this strict dependency on RxJS in this API while, at the same time, introducing these new functions that allow you to use RxJS more fluently and better supported than ever before, all of which helps you explicitly capture your intent with your code. You know, Jeremy, that said, what are we doing to make sure that developers are using these APIs correctly? Well, let me jump in here, Minko here. <laughs> <laughs> so with all these new APIs and new patterns, we have been leveraging the Angular compiler so that it can help you catch common issues. For example, the compiler's extended diagnostics can statically analyze your templates and figure out whether you're using signals without actually reading their values. This is specifically useful in conditional statements because signals are just functions, so they're pretty by default and you can easily get into this trap. Talking about debugging tooling, in version 17, we also shipped inspection of your application's 
injector tree, where you can see what is the relationship between the individual injectors and also what providers are declared inside of them. And if you go to the component explorer and select a particular component, you can preview its dependencies and also in which injector they were declared. So while talking about developer tooling, we improved type narrowing in templates with the new control flow syntax. And in version 17, we introduced the most significant change to Angular's templating since the initial release of Angular. And we're very intentional about major changes to Angular. So we wanted to walk you through the process of how the new control flow came to be. We started, we ran user studies with developers to evaluate the ergonomics of our new signal-based APIs. So we had folks with various levels of experience in web development. And some of those people use Angular, but others were used, used to React, Vue, and Svelte, et cetera, other frameworks. While watching them build an app with Angular, we noticed that all of them struggled with the template syntax, and especially with looping over a collection of items. Everyone had to look up the syntax for ng4, and many of the non-Angular developers couldn't even complete the task because the control flow was just so difficult for them. So we explored the space, and we proposed the new control flow syntax in an RFC. And we received an overwhelming amount of feedback, a lot of great suggestions and comments. One of the comments proposed an alternative syntax that we actually originally didn't consider. That comment received a lot of positive feedback, so we actually decided to formally evaluate it with user research studies. And in addition to those studies, we asked about this syntax in our annual developer survey, and with over 12,000 responses, we saw a clear, overwhelming preference for the syntax proposed in that community comment. We're really happy that the new control flow is significantly more intuitive and closer to JavaScript. It makes it trivial to use patterns such as else if and enables better type narrowing. And best of all, you can actually automatically refactor your code to the new syntax using the Angular CLI. And uh, so also while we were introducing this new control flow syntax, we took the opportunity to improve our list diffing algorithm. This allowed us to improve the performance for some specific benchmarks with up to 90% and also positioned us pretty well in the JS framework benchmarks. We also saw some surprising results. Some of our customers, they started implementing the new control flow in their applications. And Duel.com, they reported one second improvement in their largest contentful paint after switching to the new control flow. So make sure you give it a try. Using the Angular CLI, you can just run ng generate at angular slash core colon control flow, and the CLI will just refactor your project automatically for you. With this more readable syntax, you're also going to get some performance boost. Yeah, and the performance gains from control flow here are really the least of what we've been up to on the performance front over the last year, where we've really made a lot of progress. Recently, with the help of the Chrome Aurora team, we've shipped some improvements to Angular's optimized image directives. Now, in case you're not familiar with this, you can import ng optimized image and apply it to regular image elements in your code by using the ng source attribute rather than the normal source attribute. When you do this, you're enabling a suite of performance optimizations under the hood that can help improve your core web vitals. Recently, we've added support for image placeholders, automatically generated pre-connect links, and preload hints for SSR. We've seen some excellent evidence that this feature meaningfully improves core web vitals. In some e-commerce platforms, we've recorded improvements of up to 75% in largest contentful paint when using this directive, so we highly recommend trying this feature out. Last year, we also opened an RFC about declarative lazy loading and prefetching of code, and we shipped that in Angular version 17, and it's now available. It allows you to extract parts of your templates and load them on demand. Among these amazing features we've shipped, this one is probably my favorite. Build.com also uses deferrable views in production, and they've managed to reduce the bundle size for one of their apps by 
Now, talking about performance, one of the most important techniques when it comes down to optimizing for largest content pool paint is using hybrid rendering. And here by hybrid rendering, we mean using a mixture of client-side rendering, pre-rendering, or server-side rendering. In Angular version 17, we notice a significant jump in the adoption of hybrid rendering. So the number of applications in HTTP archive that are using server-side rendering or pre-rendering increased by 37%. And developers have been benefiting from using this pre-rendering and server-side rendering. For example, Virgin Media O2, they reported 72% reduction in their largest contentful paint after switching to Angular's hybrid rendering. And there has been correlation between these improvements and the increased adoption. We think that part of the reason that so many developers have started adopting this hybrid rendering are the improvements we've made to Angular CLI's build system with ES Build. So in version 16 of Angular, we released a developer preview of this new ES Build-based build system tooling that entirely replaces Webpack. To see the benefit of how we've integrated this into Angular CLI, let's look at the build pipeline. So we start off by running ng-build. This triggers the TypeScript compiler and Angular's template compiler, ngc. From there, we run through Angular's build optimizer pass. And then only at this point do we take advantage of ESBuild to produce separate client and server bundles. So we're not duplicating the earlier steps in the pipeline, thus speeding up the build. After switching to ESBuild, Vanguard saw a three times speed improvement for the production build in one of their products. Starting in Angular version 17, we have made ESBuild the default, and you can also migrate existing applications with an Angular CLI schematic. And talking about build performance, we have also seen that ng-surf has been benefiting a lot from Vite. We added a Vite plugin that introduces custom response resolution in the dev server. So based on the page that you're viewing, we're going to take different code paths. If you would like to request a pre-rendered page, we're just directly going to read it from the disk and return it. If you are doing server-side rendering in the specific route, we're just going to run Angular server-side rendering logic. And in certain cases, you may request a JavaScript bundle. So we're going to have this lazy pre-bundling. We're going to lazily pre-bundle only the part, only the JavaScript that is needed on a particular page. And we strongly believe that the fast edit refresh cycles are critical for developers' productivity. So we are really focused on optimizing for them. And there is one more interesting thing about the chart that we showed earlier, about hybrid rendering adoption. So last year, we announced the developer preview of hydration. If we zoom in version 17, we're going to see that 76% of version 17 applications are already using hydration. Looking at HTTP archive, we also see that applications have been benefiting from it. So hydration has been reducing the largest contentful paint with about 200 milliseconds in the 60th to the 80th percentile. Yeah, and so talking about hydration here, let's actually talk a little bit about the way that full page hydration, full application hydration, works in Angular today. So it starts off when your browser sends a request to the server and gets back a rendered HTML document. The browser is then going to parse that HTML and create a DOM structure. And while it's doing this, it's going to be downloading all of the page's JavaScript so that it can bootstrap the framework and then reuse all of that ex existing DOM structure that's hydrating the page and making it interactive. Recently, though, we have been researching how we might make this hydration process a little bit faster, a little bit better. And you know, earlier, we talked about that collaboration with the Wiz team. And as it turns out, Wiz has kind of their own approach to doing hydration here that can improve things quite a bit. It starts off the same way. The browser sends a request to the server and gets back that rendered HTML document, still parsing it, creating the DOM structure. But what's different is that in this improved version, we don't eagerly load all of the JavaScript right away. Instead, we only load a thin event handling layer right at the top of the page, and when the user starts interacting with the app, this event handling layer can identify the JavaScript necessary in order to uh, handle an event for a specific part of the page. So that when that event comes in, it can then download only that subset of the JavaScript and hydrate the portion of the page needed to handle the event. This technique is called partial hydration. 
Partial hydration can help web applications uh, reduce their initial bundle sizes, reducing their total blocking time and your core web vitals. So we've been actively prototyping partial hydration in Angular recently, and we're very excited about it. Once we released deferrable views, we knew we actually had the perfect building block and foundation for what could actually power Angular's partial hydration. And with partial hydration, deferrable views will behave slightly differently than with the full application hydration. Rather than rendering your placeholder on the server, we will actually render your deferrable views main template instead. So now your deferred content actually is your placeholder. And then triggers will act to uh, trigger fetching dependencies and hydrate rather than just rendering it. How cool is that? So let's take a quick look at an example of how partial hydration will behave in a real application. And in this example, you'll see a basic web layout with a header, shopping cart, navigation, footer, and a product. And you'll also see several colors. So gray in this context means that it is dehydrated. Blue will mean that a section is hydrated. And orange means that that section is actively currently fetching dependencies. And we've also introduced some artificial delays so you can actually see what's happening when it happens. So when the page first loads, the outer layout of the application hydrates eagerly, but the product area stays dehydrated. And now when we click the Add to Cart button, it starts to fetch the dependencies of the product details component and its parent component. And once it finishes, it hydrates that content, and now it's blue. But you'll notice the bottom two cards are still dehydrated, and that's because we actually haven't interacted with them yet. Now if we click Add to Cart on one of those, we'll fetch and hydrate just that one card. So we now have seven loaded components and seven hydrated components. So if we click Add to Cart on the last item, it'll actually show eight components hydrated, but only seven loaded. And this is because this is a reused component, so we don't need to fetch those dependencies again. So now if we refresh this whole page, and let's say we want multiple items, and we click that Add to Cart, cart button several times before it fetches or hydrates, in this case, we are actually queuing up those clicks, and then we're replaying them again after hydration finishes. So we still end up with six items in the cart. So this capture and replay functionality is powered by a library called JS Action, which was originally created by the Wiz team for this purpose. JS Action works by inlining a small script at the top of your index.html that sets up some global event listeners. These listeners handle events fired by elements marked with a JS action attribute, which can be added by Angular during server-side rendering to any element that has an event handler. Events are then handled and saved in a queue and replayed once hydration is complete. In this way, any user interaction that occurs while the page is hydrating is not lost. Angular using JS action in this way highlights how our collaboration and sharing with the Wiz, te Wiz team is improving the web for both developers and users alike. We talked earlier about how Wiz applications like YouTube are benefiting from all of the work Angular has done on signals. And we can see now with this how Angular applications are benefiting from the knowledge and the expertise of Wiz with JS Action. We expect that partial hydration will be available for Angular developers to start trying out later this year. And if you're using server-side rendering, you're going to need some place to deploy your application. The Angular and Firebase team have been collaborating to make Firebase app hosting the new home for Angular apps with support for server-side rendering, client rendering, and pre-rendering. Now, with all this innovation happening in Angular lately, we have been also seeing a lot of advancements in the community. For example, popular state management libraries, they already provide signal support. And we'd also like to congratulate one of our GDEs, Brandon Roberts, on the 1.0 release of Analog.js, a community-driven Angular meta framework. One of the more interesting aspects of Analog is the alternative component authoring format. This lets you build Angular components as single file components similar to Vue or Svelte. And we think it's really cool when the community explores ideas like this. We've had a lot of conversations on the Angular team 
about the friction points with Angular's component authoring experience and what we might do about them. And it's clear that Brandon has seen a lot of the same problems and is thinking about a lot of the same possible solutions. Another piece of community work we're really excited about is TanStack Angular support. Big thanks to the community for bringing TanStack query and store to the Angular ecosystem. And Jessica, I heard that recently someone introduced support for TanStack forms as well. They did. So we've been evolving the framework quite a lot recently, but you know, there's one thing that's been bugging me. This Red Shield logo seems really a bit 2010. Yeah. Um, maybe from the, around the introduction of HTML5. Yeah, and it used to have some border around it, but pretty much it has been the same in the same in one form or another. Yeah, so we think it was time for a new look, and in version 17, we introduced a new logo to reflect the more future-looking direction of Angular. Uh, but really, the, the logo is the smallest part of what we've been working on here. We, we built a brand new documentation site at angular.dev that modernizes Angular's documentation experience and adds some very useful new features. In particular, we have a new interactive getting started tutorial that lets you learn hands-on, step-by-step in the browser with Stackblitz web containers. This makes, uh, helps make onboarding with Angular easier than it has ever been. One of the pages you might visit on angular.dev is our roadmap, which details all our team's big future plans. But we want to discuss a little bit today about what we're thinking about for the future. Our backlog is effectively infinite, but we've cherry-picked a few exciting things near the top of the list that we're either working on or hope, are hoping to work on in the next year, like full zoneless, hot module replacement, streaming server-side rendering, and component authoring enhancements, just to name a few of those. The component authoring experience in particular is something that we have been thinking a lot about, because it covers very critical API surface that developers are interacting with every day. Component selectors, they're powerful, but also introduce a lot of complexity in the framework and lead to a source of friction. Developers need to import a component twice, once in the JavaScript module and once in the component that is actually going to use it. But what if we could directly reference in a template using the symbol from the JavaScript module import instead? This could simplify a few things. First of all, we can remove this redundant import in the component metadata, and we can reference the component directly with JavaScript symbol. This makes selectors unnecessary, so we can remove these. And we can also flip the default value of the standalone flag from false to true so that we can remove, remove this one as well. And while removing the redundant new lines, we get something like this. Yeah. Just to compare with the original version and selectorless. Well, in, in this selectorless flavor, we have removed a lot of the boilerplates. And uh, well, we are still in early stages of development that we have an idea how this may look for components. But we, for example, need to design it for directives and pipes. When we have something more concrete, something more specific, we're going to share a request for comments so that we can collect feedback from the community on how we are living up to our mission. Yeah, and that brings us back around to what we talked about at the beginning of the talk, which is that our mission is to help developers like you deliver web apps with confidence. We talked today about how we've improved performance with control flow, hydration, and deferrable views. We covered also the developer experience enhancements, such as signals, developer tooling, and build optimization. And as always, we're evolving the framework to keep Angular as stable and reliable as possible. To learn more and try out all of the great Angular features that we talked about today, visit our website at angular.dev. That is all we have for you. Thanks for watching. Thank you.